From the vast reaches of the Mongolian steppe, an army of over 100,000 men swept aside all resistance, claiming territories that spanned continents. Their leader, Genghis Khan, proclaimed his life's ambition was to unite the world under one empire. Having conquered the East, the Mongols turned their attention to the West, where they would come face to face with some of the greatest armies of medieval Europe. Would Genghis Khan's legendary warriors finally meet their match? By 1221, the Mongols had taken cities throughout Asia, generating vast amounts of tribute from those they conquered. The West, however, was still an untapped resource. Genghis Khan sent his trusted generals, Jebe and Subutai, to attack Europe. With an army of 20,000, Jebe and Subutai took the West by surprise, raiding cities and destroying armies. Within two years, they had the prosperous Rus territories in their sights. But in their way was a Rus army of over 40,000 men. Outnumbered, Jebe and Subutai turned and started to head back east. The Rus sensed an easy victory and set off in pursuit of their retreating enemies. For eight days, the fast-moving Mongols stayed just out of reach. Then, Jebe and Subutai set their trap. They lured the Rus across the Kalka River and turned to fight. The Rus had fallen for one of the Mongols' most effective tactics, the feigned retreat. The stage was set for the Mongol army to test themselves against Europe's finest. The Mongols charged across the European plains with the fatigued Rus army in close pursuit. The Rus had fallen for the Mongol tactic of the feigned retreat and unknowingly followed them into peril. The Mongol general sprung his trap on the enemy scouts. With the Rus scouts cut down, General Subutai crossed the Kalka River. Here, he would stage a full-scale ambush on the vast Rus army. Subutai directed his warriors to split up and lie in wait for the enemy.
For Subutai's strategy to be effective, he needed to spring his trap before the Rus recovered from their long pursuit. He sent his most fearsome Mangadai horse archers to draw the Rus quickly towards the ambush site. These highly skilled warriors could fire their bows rapidly while riding at speed. The Mongol provocation was effective, and the Rus hastily pursued. The Rus army had fallen for the feigned retreat and rode straight into the Mongol ambush. With the enemy surrounded, Subutai's battle-ready warriors descended from all sides. The Mongol ambush was devastating, and Rus numbers were reduced to a few desperate stragglers. Seeing the fate of their comrades, the last Rus encircled themselves in a makeshift fort of baggage carts. The Rus stockade fell. Despite a valiant last stand, the remnants of the Rus army were cut down. Spurred on by the crushing victory at the Kalka River, the Mongols advanced ever further into the heartland of the Rus.
confusion of battle, communications were vital. One solution was the use of message arrows. Signal arrows could be used to send messages to your drone troops. Faster than a man, faster than a horse. It was the quickest way to communicate in the heat of battle. Whistling arrows were blunt, and most importantly, they announced their arrival. But they weren't just used to pass written messages. When shot in a volley, whistling arrows could be loud enough to signal to a small group of warriors, telling them both where and when to attack. On hearing the sound, they would gallop in and strike where the arrows landed. However, a much louder sound was required to sound the retreat or to communicate to the whole army. That was the job of the war drums. Mongols also used gongs, and the combinations of drums and gongs gave the Mongols a wide array of signaling options. We do not know the exact rhythms they used, but basic commands could be conveyed with different percussive patterns. They enabled the Mongols to communicate with their own forces and strike fear into the enemy. They were the heartbeat of the Mongol army.